Well, thank you very much, and everybody who is here to listen to the lecture in the afternoon. I should begin by with two things. One is when this program actually first started, not did not first start, but first they tried to make it going beyond the German speaking group of economists, young economists, that was in the late 80s, sometime in the mid 80s. I was one of the first people to come here in the very first year when they tried to internationalize the program. And this is the second time I have come after, I don't know, a period of some 25 years and so. I don't come to Europe or to America very often. I live in India. And this has been really a great pleasure because it's also for me capturing old time and see how much the post keynesian and the non-mainstream group has grown. Can you hear me at the back? Okay. You can? Okay. So this is a real pleasure to see how much the group has grown from the time when I first visited. And if we were in the lecture in the morning, first presented in a very uh, elementary form, the so-called profit-led, wage-led growth uh, model. The other reason why it is, you know, I wanted to st say something just before starting the lecture <clears throat> is because I do not know the level. And I'm sure there is people who specialize in particular growth models, growth theory, technical progress, distribution, how to, int int all kinds of issues connected with growth theory, business cycles, how to integrate the two, the econometrics of it. There are also many people who actually are not working on growth theory proper. And when I decided to come to give the introductory lecture, I wanted to put it at a level where it is simple, but I think you can see the contrast between much, I hope, you will see the contrast between a roughly a Keynesian way of approaching the problem of growth and the neoclassical way of approaching the problem of growth. And since modern growth theory has almost meant Robert Solo's growth model, I think it is much more important to see how the question has been changed from what it actually was and how much more interesting the original question was, particularly in Europe today, with this talk coming back of you know secular stagnation and all these things that the original way to formulate the growth theory was had a much richer content than what goes under the name of growth theory and long-term growth model. I hope at least that should become clear from this one lecture. Now, the, let me start. The growth theory actually started not with Keynes, I mean, as we know it, but as you all know, the growth theory started with Harrod who was, I mean, I know him, I knew him a little bit, not very well, but he was one of the few people who were connected with, actually were connected with the writing of the general theory, and who had a major contribution in saying that the saving investment equality does not come through what used to be called the loanable fund theory and the interest rate adjusting to equate investment and saving, it actually comes to the level of economic activity. And if you see, some of you, if you see the general theory, you'll even see a reference to Harrod. Harrod took this idea that saving investment equality determines income, which we all know. He wanted to take this idea and generalize it to, a, to the context of growth. To the context of growth, without forgetting that the problem of effective demand or the problem of saving investment equality determining output, the problem continues throughout in a capitalist economy and there is no short term or a long term. Now, what does it mean? 
It means basically that if you start from your textbook, and I started almost with a lovely diagram which will probably make many of you laugh, but yeah, which you all know the diagram, saving investment on this side and income on that side. But please, you know it, but don't take it too easily because people, famous economists, make the mistakes very often. If you look at this diagram, it is a flow diagram. It is a flow diagram meaning there is no stock. It is only the expenditure and income being determined in a particular period of time. Now, in this diagram, there are two things. In this diagram, there are, sorry. In this diagram, there are two things which are being said. One is we do not say anything about investment. Now you can, can you hear? Can everybody hear? If you can't hear because I tend to go away, so you raise your hand, I will come back to the one. Now, basically what you have is investment which is about which we don't have a theory. So-called animal spirit and so on, whatever you take, investment is taken as given. Savings is the one which adjusts to make income, okay? Now, the trick here and the basic difference here is between this way of looking at the problem with which Harriet started and to which a few American economists have tried to come back now, like, you know, Akerlof and so on in their recent book, Animal Spirit and so on, in, in a very haphazard way. But anyway, they have tried to come back to this. And what came to be known as the models of growth models how to incorporate the supply side and so on and so forth. Now, if you take Haddad's problem, you get the distinction comes immediately from the previous diagram, that you get a distinction which, for example, doesn't exist in solo. You get a distinction between what is called the warranted rate of growth and the actual rate of growth. The warranted rate of growth is the rate of growth at which actually investment does not have an outside role or an exogenous role. Investment is just what saving is, you know, like in Ricardo Reich, like in everybody else. This is why people like John Robinson and so on used to call it a kind of bastard Keynesian model. It looks Keynesian, but it is not Keynesian because it basically is savings-driven, and the investment is entirely a part of the savings. The warranted rate of growth is actually a rate of growth where there is an independent notion of investment, but we assume that, that planned independent notion of investment is matched by the, you know, uh, is planned savings, and it can be only matched by the planned savings if income is at the right level. At that right level, the savings which takes place is equal to the investment. And as opposed to this, there is inherent an actual rate of growth, which is just the investment which has taken place. The investment which you do, and if you do a, take any arbitrary level of investment, depending on history, depending on a particular point of time, if you take a particular level of investment, at that level of investment, there would be a certain level of effective demand, there would be a certain level of income, like in the previous diagram, there would be a certain level of income, and at that level of income, there would be a certain level of savings. This is where Haddad's story starts, and this is where actually Keynesian growth theory starts. You know, the natural rate of growth, and we'll come to that, and you know, the way Solo and later, you know, in Chicago and so on, what is this man's name? Don't, Romer and so on, reformulated the theory. It is entirely on a different track and actually does not make this distinction ever. That actually, if you read, if some of you read Solo's classic 56 paper or Swans, who was an Australian economist who did the same thing, less elegantly, the same year in 1956, but geometrically rather than using a simple differential equation. They both were doing 
asking a question which is very different. Now, if you take this idea of the growth rate, of two ideas of growth, then the question becomes, what happens if, like in a real economy, if businessmen decide to invest some amount which is different from what would be the planned savings of households? Say, you, I, we all, I mean, you know, because the, the problem is not mathematical. The problem is to really understand the fundamental. That you, I, we all have a certain expected income, including, let us say, the overdraft and so on we can get from the bank, on the basis of which we say that this is our earning and we plan a certain amount of savings. Okay? Now, if the investment which takes place and creates a level of demand, which creates a level of income which is different from this, what would happen? Either your income would increase, either more people would be employed, more income would be made, or there would be less people employed. This is the idea in Keynes, this is the idea in Kaletsky, this is the idea in Richard Kahn, and the whole Cambridge tradition, or the Keynesian tradition, is basically this. Now, suppose you take any arbitrary level of investment, and at that level of investment, you ask, what happens to the idea of growth? How would the growth react? Had it gave a very simple and very interesting answer. He said, suppose you, in your investment happens to be much higher. The actual investment, or what he calls the actual rate of growth, happens to be much higher than the warranted rate. Warranted rate meaning the rate at which the planned investment is taking place. Suppose the actual rate is higher. More demand will be generated. What would firms do? Firms will beat this demand by how? By expanding their, not expanding their capacity, but by utilizing their capacity more. Had its problem, I mean, in the original, the paper was written, published in 1939, written in 1937. The had its problem actually was he did not have a good analytical representation of how to represent capacity utilization. But, I mean, a simple, for a simple growth model and so on, he didn't have a capacity utilization. So he said, used a lot of words and so on, but basically his idea was correct. That, and so was Keynes, who was a referee for the paper, that basically if you invest more than what the savings is, then at that investment there would be more demand, okay? Because, and at that more demand there would be firms who try to meet, the, meet that demand by creating, utilizing more capacity, okay? As they utilize more capacity, and there comes the notion of an investment function, which you heard in the morning, which you know, all of you estimate whoever is doing macroeconomics in various ways. But the first time a clear investment function comes exactly in that form. That capacity utilization or what is called some sort of an acceleration principle uh, would operate. And if capacity utilization is higher, firms will not only invest, not only utilize capacity more to meet today's demand, but they would also do something else. They would also invest more because investment is a function of, one of the arguments of investment function would be the degree of capacity utilization. If capacity utilization is low, then investment would be depressed. If capacity utilization is high, investment would be more. Uh, this is also the idea which we used in the so-called uh, profit-led, wage-led growth to break up the thing. Now, if you take Harrod's idea and formalize it a little bit, I, I haven't seen this. I mean, it's not a formalization. It's a simple change of notation. Then you can write it like this. If you see the top one, the warranted rate of growth is actually what the savings ratio is. Okay? And this would be the, this would be the planned savings, this would be a planned investment. And why start by Y? Why start by K? is the uh, uh, capital output ratio at desired capacity level or full capacity level or normal capacity level at whatever is your benchmark 
capacity utilization, this would be your warranted rate of growth. That is the capacity which businessmen wanted to use, the rate at which they expected the market to expand, this is the rate at which the market is expanding, and that is the warranted rate of growth. In simple words, and that is where good theory is always have a simplicity, that basically your market is expanding, the businessman's sales expectations are exactly being satisfied. That is what the warranted rate of growth means. Because the capacity utilization remains at the normal level, you know, at the level at which businessmen wanted it to be, desired it to be. The actual rate of growth is, I have put, if you look at it, there is a Z or Z as you call it, which is the, between zero and one, that is the, it is not the normal capacity utilization, it is only when Z is one, only when Z is one, you have normal capacity utilization. Otherwise, either capacity is being utilized more or capacity is being utilized less. Okay, and from, is this clear? So from this, you get the idea that if, in, if, the actual rate exceeds the warranted rate. You could easily set it up as a differential equation, uh, phase diagram and so on, but it's not necessary. <laughs> if, you, the, if the actual rate of growth exceeds the warranted rate, then the only thing which is different is the degree of capacity utilization, following Harrod, you know, okay. As the capacity utilization is different, if it is higher, they invest more, so in next period, what happens? There is still more investment. The economy is highly unstable. The Harrods knife is. The economy is highly unstable. It goes off. And if the, and you know, if Z is less than one, it goes down. There was a, you know, just to say sort of on the side, there was a ex exchange of letter between Harrod and Keynes in which Keynes said that I, I agree with, I mean, I instinctively agree with you that a laissez-faire capitalist economy is highly unstable. But it's too unstable. You have to think of something which makes it stable. And this was, I mean, there, I don't know the answer, but I think, you know, the fact that this sort of knife-edge instability is, of course, a theoretical property that it goes off, but either because the government, without government action, if you leave it entirely on its own, this was the main message Harrod wanted to carry. That, that your simple saving investment diagram, that very simple diagram, once you allow the investment to change and relate to capacity utilization, it becomes and highly unstable system in the context. Of, oh. Okay. Now, this idea, this idea of Harrod was then generalized by I think most clearly by John Robinson, who they did not agree very much, but she found a way in which Harrod's problem could be largely dealt with and the knife edge could be sort of blunted. And her idea was simply this, that you see, think of accumulation, okay? I mean, think of the rate of growth, actual rate of growth, which depends not simply on capacity utilization, but much more, which is plausible, it depends on the rate of profit, okay? And as you will see, this is what is also of connected with distribution and so on. So in that case, Sorry, I am not used to it very much. In that case, you can look at the rate of growth, uh, rate of profit, 
if investment depends on the if rate of invest rate of accumulation rate of growth depends on the rate of profit then you can break up the rate of profit in a very simple way you can break up the rate of profit as a share of profit the first term degree of capacity utilization that is output to capacity output and the ideal capital output ratio that is the ideal capital output ratio meaning the uh, capacity utilization at the ideal rate uh, whatever the rate at which the firms actually plan the capacity utilization to be this is actually the thing which is used and this is basically the decomposition which gives you the wage led profit led growth and you know the good win cycles many in very many what you were hearing in the morning all of this is based on various playing around with various aspects of this decomposition if you look at this decomposition it consists of three elements it consists of profit share it consists of capacity utilization and it consists of capital output ratio now if you look at traditional neoclassical theory to which i'll come later what happens there in traditional neoclassical theory it is the last term which that is what actually if you want to give actual meaning analytical meaning to terms like long term when there is no problem of effective demand like you know originally solo wrote in 1956 and then again in 1970 all that they were doing they were making the adjustment through the final term that is the ideal capital output ratio there is full employment in the economy actual capacity utilization adjusts in such a way as you will see later adjusts in such a way as to equate saving and investment but in the keynesian models there is also the possibility of profit share changing but even if you take the profit share as given of the capacity utilization changing following herrett this model was basically used by john robinson she used it in a slightly over simplistic way but anyway this model was slightly used by john robinson and i think firstly she gave out the an answer to herrett's question which she could not answer in a big book called accumulation of capital written in 1956 but in 62 she published a small book theory of economic growth in which she produces this model which is now a very well known which is really the counterpart to solo's model of the simplest keynesian prototype model that i wanted wanted you to see and her problem is not solo's problem of natural rate of growth but how saving and investment are kept equal over time and this is the answer which she gives which comes here again i would i would not give differential equations and so on you can do it quite simply but look at the problem from a you have the two rates of growth the actual rate of growth and the warranted rate of growth and on this other hand sand you have the rate of profit that rate of profit as i already told you is a decomposition of depends on the share of profit the degree of capacity utilization r degree of capacity utilization and the uh, normal capacity to uh, accountant's book value of capital capital output ratio now suppose you start at a point like i have started i mean you could do it as a difference equation you could do it as a phase diagram like in solo and so on you could do exactly the same sort of phase diagram as solo has but just look at it this way take any arbitrary how do you show take any arbitrary this i can mark some somehow this point yes on the board yeah which one the red button red button okay okay you start at any arbitrary rate of profit at this rate of profit you have say for example businessman's desired rate of growth which is the warranted rate of growth as mrs robinson would have said 
at this rate of profit, this is the rate at which businessmen would like to grow. Okay. But given the existing amount of save, you know, exist at this rate of profit, given the savings rate, and assuming there is no uh, savings out of wages and so on, I'll come to it later. Assuming there is no savings out of wages, this is the savings per unit of capital which would be generated. This is the savings which would be, or this is the amount of investment which businessmen would do per unit of capital. I mean, this is, this is the simplest way to, uh, non-formal way to see it. This is the amount of investment per head, which uh, amount of investment per capital, which per unit of capital, which businessmen would like to do at this rate of profit. This is the amount of savings which will do. So there is more savings and investment, and Harrod's process takes place, or John Robinson's process takes place, because this high rate of profit, uh, this high rate of investment per unit of capital, or this high rate of growth, will push the economy to a higher rate of profit. Why? Because the rate of profit would be now higher here. The rate of profit would now be higher because at that rate, at that rate of growth, you have more effective demand, isn't it? More effective demand compared to You have, you have more effective demand, more capacity utilization, and therefore more profit. Now, there is, since I'm summarizing the whole of growth theory and the contrast between the two types of growth theory, I should tell you something. You see, there are two ways, and there is a difference between, let us say, somebody who independently discovered the whole of the effective demand theory, that is Kaletsky and Keynes and which, which is quite significant, not Keynes, but the later Keynesians, particularly Mrs. Robinson, to some extent, Caldor, Pasinetti, all of them. You see, for traditional Keynesian short period analysis, and this is very important when you do it, for traditional Keynesian short period analysis, what you have is, if you have higher demand, you get higher profit, but higher profit comes from what? Because you utilize your capacity more. As you utilize your capacity more at the same profit margin or the same profit share, which is uh, correspond to your profit margin, at the same profit margin, you sell more output. You know, for example, this is what uh, I once explained to when we were doing this profit wage led growth. I explained to Stephen Margolin that it is like the McDonald, that you know you have a small profit margin, but if you, you can make a lot of profit because you sell a lot. This is one kind of business model. You can have another kind of business model, which is the business model of the boutique, you know, fashionable clothes and so on. You have a high profit margin, you sell few, but you make the profit. This is actually the difference and this is the difference which also comes here. Because when you have more investment, what changes? If you have more investment and more effective demand, Mrs. Robinson would say that this means that there is, this means that there is more profit. Now, if you look at Pasinetti's 1962 article, which is an extension of this, I'll come in a minute. What they are doing is that if for some reason, and this was, I think, one of Caldor's fault, that if the Effective demand, if you maintain, if you assume somehow capacity utilization is at normal or is not going to change or whatever the reason is, if you hold capacity utilization constant, then your higher rate of profit, higher profit can only come from higher profit margin, higher profit share. Think of this diagram here. It is the first term. This, this term will have to rise. For a higher profit rate, this profit share will have to rise. If, it is, if you are in a Kaletskian situation or in a traditional Keynesian situation with excess capacity, this term will be the one which will basically adjust. And when, 
we did the profit led wage rate blah blah that kind of stuff it was basically breaking it up into these two components there is nothing more to it than that okay so you have so you have these two when investment when the businessmen's desired rate of growth or the warranted rate of growth is higher than the actual rate of growth lot of investment is taking place and the profit increases either because there is more capacity utilization or because there is more profit per unit of sale and more profit comes because prices profit margin has increased profit have to be price has to be higher than the money wage so both this this is suppressed in the model i mean in john robinson's discussion and model this is suppressed or she actually talks about normal capacity utilization straffer's book was published so they tried to bring that in and this is this is the profit rate then again at this rate of profit business can have a still there is still a gap between the desired rate of growth and the actual rate of growth and therefore the profit rate moves until it converges to this okay if the curve was different and so on except for this well the stability property would be different and so on but this is this is what actually just like if the production function did not have what the textbooks have if there were increasing return and so on none of the solos stability condition and so on would hold i mean without some special condition similarly here but you can just for those of you who have a taste for algebra this this analysis on this diagram is a little bit more general than is being shown for two reasons first of course the it is a local stability property would depend on the this slope being the slope of the investment desired rate being smaller than the slope of the savings which is the usual keynesian condition which if you just take the first order tellerize linear case you will get it the second which is more interesting is what is when i say and i have simplified the diagram when i say that the warranted rate of growth depends on the rate of profit what is the rate of profit i heard in the mo morning you know uh, robert robert blicker he said that you know john robinson was the one who said that you know it is a proxy the actual rate of profit is a proxy for the warranted rate, for the expected rate of profit if you take the expected rate of profit and if you assume that the warranted again it is very simple to introduce it here as a trivial algebra if you take the expected rate of profit not in terms of you know adapted by expectation or some other theory of expectation but simply as a function of the actual rate of profit if actual rate of profit is higher expected rate of profit is higher then you get a neat condition that this stability will continue to hold so long as i mean it is not there in john robinson and so on but it's very easy to work out that this condition will continue to hold so long as expectation is in elastic or static that is a 1% increase in the actual rate of growth and you can see the intuition behind this if 1% increase in the rate of growth leads to let us say 1% increase in the rate of growth leads to let us say half a percent increase in the expected rate of growth expected rate of profit 1% increase in the actual rate of profit leads to half a percent increase in the rate of expected rate of profit in expectation elasticity of expect, expectation is low in elastic expectation in that case stability condition would continue to hold but now as a thought experiment think of a case and this is this is these are the sort of things you get of, out of a keynesian model that think of a case where for example the market is booming expectations are very high okay the people think that the future is going to be even better than the present the elasticity of expectation is greater than 1 1% increase in expectation leads to more than 1% increase in the 
1% increase in the actual rate of profit leads to more than 1% increase in the expected rate of profit. You know what you will find? The model will necessarily become unstable. So the stability of the model depends on two things. The stability of the model actually depends on two things. It depends on expectation being moderate, which makes sense, and it depends on the classical Keynesian requirement of the multiplier being stable, that is, the savings propensity, this slope, which is the propensity to save, the propensity to save is greater than the propensity to invest, which is needed for multiplier, so-called nowadays what is called super multiplier, to be a stable system. Now, this is what the simplest Keynesian model would do. And those of you who want to work on post-Keynesian growth theory to get something new, this is, I repeat, this is the prototype model with three kinds of possible generalizations. One, that the rate of profit changes either because, as I said, either because distribution changes, profit margin changes, or capacity utilization changes, or expectation is different. And using this tree, you can produce virtually any, any kind of cycle, any kind of model, economically speaking. The algebra, of course, would get more and more tricky as you do it. But this, this I mean, I have checked it. I mean, I'm putting the lecture at a level where everybody can see the basic thrust. But you can do the algebra, and all this will come out. Now, no, oh, I have written this. I didn't realize. Three comments are in. I thought I thought I had not written. The first one: it is based on a mechanism, a selective model of business cycle. It is, sim it is based on a model, on a mechanism similar to Kaletsky's model of business cycle in so far as the reinforcing mechanism is either in either upswing or downswing is concerned. Higher, lower investment causes higher, lower profit through higher capacity utilization. This is exactly, that is why we say that Kaletsky in a parallel way discovered what Keynes discovered a couple of years earlier. That is the theory of effective demand. If you have higher investment in Kaletsky's theory, profit equation, there would be higher profit. If there is higher profit, there would be still more investment. If there is still more investment, the system will blow up. That is how the business upswing takes place in Kaletsky. And then he has to bring in a, another mechanism to make it into a business cycle theory. And it is the same thing which is happening in John Robinson's model. That, and that is why she was so influenced by Kaletsky also. That when the in the context of growth, it is the same mechanism which is happening. That is what I've written. It is based on a mechanism similar to Kaletsky's model of business cycle, in so far as the reinforcing mechanism is in either upswing or downswing is concerned. Higher investment or lower investment causes higher or lower profit through higher capacity utilization, like in Keynes' theory, which in turn causes higher, lower profit. Turning point of the cycles are explained by depressing effects of capital stock, which is accumulated investment. This is in Kaletsky. Kaletsky talks of a business cycle where you know then the you invest more, you get more profit, you invest still more, you get still more profit. Where do you stop? And this is also in Minsky, Kaletsky's profit equation. Where do you stop? Kaletsky said you stop where capital stock becomes bigger and bigger and gives a depressing effect. I don't think it's a very great answer, but this is how his business cycle comes to an end. Hicks puts a, puts a ceiling on a similar kind of model and so on. Okay. Now, the second thing is, I think it's a relatively forgotten, but quite an interesting Pasinetti, who was in Cambridge in those days, produced around the same time as John Robinson's model, a similar generalization where he said, look, it really, if you are in steady growth, that is, if you are thinking of the, 
if you are thinking of the equilibrium point, if you are thinking of the equilibrium point where the economy is growing at a steady rate, it does not matter, it does not matter whether workers save or not, because workers saving do not matter. It looked like I remember the semi, you know, the secret seminar, anyway, the seminar which Pasineti gave, in which everybody said the result cannot be true. But Pasineti said, you know, the result is true. I'm finding it over and over again in every way. In, the paper was published in 62, I think it was in early 1962 that he published the paper. But the reason for the Pasineti's model and the puzzle which it created is actually very simple. Again, it is, it is almost trivial because what he does is he assumes that there is a class of work, there is a class of capitalists who only have you see what he, this is what he proved that this condition will always hold. It is only capitalist savings propensity which would matter and the growth rate would be like in that equation would be equal to the rate of profit multiplied by the savings rate. But what he showed why this works is relatively simple and I have just said it. Uh, you know Samuelson and Bondigliani published a paper many other people said Frank Kahn who used to supervise me said how can this be true but actually the result follows from an old idea, and the idea was generalized by Piero Sraffa, actually in his production of commodities by means of commodities in a completely different context. And this is a Ricardian idea, which is the idea of the pure ratio, which Sraffa's introduction to Ricardo was for the first time found. And that basically says that if you have a pure class of, if you have a, if you have a pure number, say for example in Ricardo it is, In Ricardo, it is agriculture. If agriculture only uses agricultural goods as working capital and produces agricultural surplus as working capital, then you get capital is, let us say, corn. As Rafa said, capital is corn and output is corn. Surplus is corn. So it is corn divided by corn. The rate of profit is corn divided by corn. It's a real pure number, right? Per unit of time, this is the rate of profit. Now, you take that pure number and you say now it must hold for every other period. In a much more sophisticated model, for example, von Neumann's general equilibrium, if any of you have studied it. Von Neumann's general equilibrium model of steady state growth is exactly the same property. You have a pure number which comes out, different things grows at different rate, but there is a lowest growing you know, input. The lowest growing input gives you the, you know, uh, sets the base, which must de determine the rate at which the economy grows. Once you understand that, you will understand a lot of relatively sophisticated models, turnpike theorem, von Neumann model, at a simpler level, Pasinetti's model, Ricardo's, Schaffer's standard commodity, you see, all of them has one thing in common, and that is there is a pure ratio which you somehow are able to define by the way you set up the model. In Pasinetti, he sets up the model by saying that there is a capitalist class which only earns profit, which owns part of the capital only earns profit. So you see, they have a profit and they have a capital. That determines the rate of profit of the economy as a pure number. Then there is a Working, there is a class of workers, workers who also own some property. And for that class of workers who, are, who also own some property, it's a mixed income. Part of their income comes from wage, part of their income comes from profit. The thing is, but if it partly comes from income, partly comes from profit, you do not have a pure ratio. But the ratio there, how much profit they will get if the same rate of profit arbitrage and so on, the same rate of profit holds on all capital, then they must also get the same profit, QED. And this is why you get the same result 
in because you have defined a rate of profit as a pure number for the capitalist class and that must hold for the workers now. And if that holds for the worker now, the worker's savings propensity must adjust in such a way. Now you read Pasinetti's model and so on. Weakness of Pasinetti's kind of analysis was what I already told you. I mean, economics. This was not the mathematics. The economics of the Pasinetti's models, that class of models weaknesses, it assumes steady state growth and there only high or low profit you can think of in terms of changes in the, not capacity utilization, but changes in share of profit, changes in profit. <coughs> anyway, this is the second thing. Third is, I think this is, I think, yeah, I think this is, since I'm giving the lecture, I have to make a little bit of advertisement. So, <laughs> sorry for that, but I've already said it, this is the same, same model which I, I mean the same decomposition which I showed you that note that both the profit share and capacity utilization enter in the determination of the profit rate but it has some implication at technologically given output capital ratio as stated before that is you know the rate of profit depends on the share of profit which is H Z which is the degree of capacity utilization and A which is the normal capacity, normal output uh, accountant's book value of capital ratio. We consider, more gener we consider more general investment functions where H and Z are independent arguments rather than related in a specific way. You see, if you take the rate of profit, H and Z would be related how? Through a rectangular hyperbola, isn't it? Given A for given any level of A, for given any level of output to capital ratio, it will be a simply rectangular hyperbola. So you'd have several rectangular hyperbola depending on what capital output ratio you are taking. But in our case, we say that for, and the reason why we say it, I remember we were discussing it, the reason why we say it is a very simple one. Suppose you have a, suppose you go back to Harrods model. This is how you think of economics. Go back to Harrods model. Suppose the warranted rate of growth is higher, okay? That is, businessmen want to, are, expe are desire to invest more because they expect more market to expand faster. So they invest more. There is more effective demand which is created in the economy, okay? Now, as more effective demand is created in the economy, suppose the economy is working at, to take an extreme case, and you will give me the answer. Suppose the economy is working at 10% capacity utilization, very low capacity utilization. The economy is in a deep depression or in a you know, severe recession. If you have more stimulus, if you create more, what would happen? If you, if you, if you give a more uh, stimulus or if you invest more or businessmen, private investment for some reason decide to invest more because more money is injected in the banks at a lower rate, they, decide to invest more, whatever that story you want to tell. Suppose businessmen decide to invest more, what would happen in this case? Firms will not generally expand capacity because they are at 10%, they would be at 20%. Or they would expand capacity at a very slow rate because already their capacity utilization is so low that until it comes back to a certain level, they will not invest more. This is the beginning of Goodwin kind of, I mean, this is the kind of cycle which Robert was talking about, you can get something similar here. If it is 80% capacity utilization and there is more investment which is done, more demand which is created, businessmen will immediately decide to invest more because they cannot meet that demand without expanding capacity in the next period and so on. So this period they might do over time and so on, but they will. In, this will go on. So depending on your initial capacity utilization, the name for this is hysteresis. Depending on your initial capacity utilization, it will depend whether you invest more in capacity utilization or not. So it is for this reason that we decided to break up, not 
treat the rate of profit as the argument for the investment function, but break up the rate of profit into profit margin or profitability and capacity utilization. It is the same thing. And if you want to do a growth model with technical change, you can also bring in A, because the, all the three are involved in the capacity. And this will give you three variations of, the, of a growth model which you can do. Now, now let me go to the model which you all know. Sooner, at some stage in your life, you had to do it in whichever university you were. That is the Solos 56 model and various, you know, various variations of this. And see, I have done it in a way which exactly is very similar. I have drawn diagrams which is exactly similar just vi visually to the diagram which, you, which I drew in John Robinson's case. Of course, they are quite different in terms of what they mean. I would not go through this model because all of you know it. But you know, this is assuming homogeneous production function of degree one, constant returns to scale, that is. And so on, savings is this. K is K by L. And if you take the rate at which K is, the small K is changing, that is the capital output ratio, capital labor ratio is changing, is the rate of change of capital accumulation minus the rate of change of labor force. What is the crux of this model? Algebra apart. It's an elegant algebra, simple algebra. But what is the crux of the model? The crux of the model is this savings which is coming per head is determining for you at what rate capital labor ratio should be growing. Okay? And the capital labor ratio will grow until the point it, the two growth rates are equal and labor and capital grows at the same rate, okay? One difference between this model and the other, which when you work on finance and so on, it, I mean, try to introduce finance into Keynesian model becomes it. In the solo kind of model, it is the stocks which adjust. It is the stock of capital to the stock of labor which adjusts. What adjusts in the Harrod model? It is a flow which adjusts. It is a share of current output to full capacity output which adjusts. It is the capital labor ratio. Or the profit margin. But here it, the stocks adjust. And of course, if you assume perfect competition, blah, blah, and everything, it has a dual. The profit and the wage comes from the dual. But actually what is adjusting in the model is the Given the savings behavior, it's an entirely savings-driven model in which the capital labor ratio adjusts. Just to take one more minute on this model, which you all know, the, tell me what is the, if you bring in human capital, if you bring in, you know, what, what, what changes? What changes in the model? It is the capital labor ratio, the efficiency of the capital ratio, how much output it can produce. This is what changes. In the entire human capital story, you know, the Lucas's model, except for the last model of which is slightly different. It is here. There will be a different kind of notion of labor in efficiency unit, and this is what will adjust. And that same savings, the same mechanism would work on the model. I would not go into this anymore because my purpose is basically to show the contrast. Okay, this you can, I mean, there is nothing. So that this would be the differential equation which you all know. And I leave it to you to do the, exactly the same, write the same differential equation for the model which I did not write deliberately. This is a different here, the, the logarithm is different, et cetera, et cetera. You can do this. But you see, you can do the same differential equation. Here you take, rather than k, oh. 
rather than K. <laughs> okay, no, I think I will do it from okay. here. <laughs> rather than K, but then I can't show this, you see. <laughs> I'm not so, rather than looking at K, you take the variable as R, the rate of profit, first. Okay, I'll tell you how to do a PhD on Keynesian growth models and quite an interesting way to go about it, at least how to start. Rather than K, you think of the rate of profit. The change in the rate of profit depends on what? On the difference between, rather than in the solo model, it depends between the warranted rate of growth and the actual rate of growth. The actual rate of growth is S into R. It is determined by the savings, actual savings which takes place in the economy. The warranted rate of growth depends on the investment function which I wrote, which depends on the rate of here. It will depend on the I can't do it. <laughs> it will depend on the uh, investment function, and you, you, you will get all the results exactly you get in the solo model, exactly as a parallel. What I'm trying to show you is that for this lecture, a grand scheme in which formally, not the economics, the formally the neoclassical model gives you one kind of solution, where the capitals, where the stocks adjust, the cap capital stock to labor stock, and there is a Keynesian models where the flows adjust in terms of capacity utilization. And the Keynesian model can be in improved much more if you take exactly what we did, and I did it for, you know, for an essay in honor of John Robinson, the, which was basically to, you don't take the rate of profit, you take the capacity utilization. Capacity utilization and profit share capacity utilization and profit share as two separate variables, you get a couple of different, couple differential equation and you can do the same analysis in a different way, just by taking the decomposition of the rate of profit. Now, now before I give you chance to speak and I stop for the moment, what time do we finish? About an hour. I can take a little bit more time. I don't have much more to say unless I go into a specific mode. Yeah. Okay. Now, before I go into questions, there are two things which I wanted to say, and one was this year's two types of so called Nobel Memorial Prizes, which are given one for technical progress and one for carbon pricing both of which are different ways of how to integrate technical progress. I want to say something because if growth models have any use in a sort of long-term sense, it would be not only to say just the statistical growth rate, but what it means in terms of sustainability, growth, carbon pricing, and so on. I want to say two things on this which are important. One is of great political importance, the other is of great ecological importance. Let me first start with the thing of political importance. You see, in this model, if you introduce technical progress, if you introduce technical progress from a neoclassical side, it's, the answer is quite straightforward. I mean, in textbook, you will say the production function shifts, or you would have some sort of a vintage capital model, you would have different versions of this. But the basic property of all neoclassical models would be only one. And that property would be that being a supply side model, being a savings determined model, an increase in technical progress would increase your total potential output. And potential output would always be pro produced because there is no problem of effective demand in neoclassical model. Okay. So once this happens, you will, you will have more savings, you would have a higher rate of accumulation, you would have a higher rate of growth. This is always the answer which you get, whether you take somebody who is, was far more critical at the vision of capitalism, Schumpeter, 
or if you take somebody much simpler like you know this year this Paul Roma all of them have this kind of an answer a higher savings propens a higher rate of technical progress would increase your rate of growth in Haddad or in John Robinson's model this is not necessarily the case it will increase the natural rate of growth it will increase the rate at which the potentially the economy can grow let us say but the potentially the economy can grow does not mean the economy will be growing at that rate the economy can continue to grow at a much lower rate and can create unemployment take a very simple example an example which you know i got not from growth theory but actually from india and visiting china that you see in both in india and china i was telling in another class both in india and china there is a tremendous amount of unemployment and resistance which is taking place because of land acquisition for industrialization right now which is going on in all these countries peasants you know sort of tribal people who traditionally live on land they are very much up against this kind of thing now for a moment step outside this sort of esoteric world of pure growth models and so on suppose you take away land from a poor agricultural area i am not talking about human poverty and so on but you take away land there were suppose there were 10 people who were working on the land which is taken away for industrialization what do you do you take away the land you give it to a let us say large corporation to produce much more the corporation produces let us say six times 10 times more so the corporation produces 10 times more but it only uses two laborers using two laborers it produces you know more output than all the 10 people who are producing before because they have a low productivity they have a low productivity but they had a livelihood so you have a conflict between livelihood and productivity you have a conflict between efficiency and productivity that is and this is actually not a theoretical thing this is happening in europe and this will happen more and more as artificial intelligence and so on comes in what is the basic problem the basic problem is having again effective demand you see schumpeter's what do you call uh, creative destruction and that kind of assumption why doesn't it work or for that matter those of you who do uh, you know uh, development theory and so on the unlimited supply of labor and lewis and so on why doesn't it work why doesn't it work that way why do we see much more open unemployment people employed unemployed and so on because when you increase to technical progress product labor productivity you basically have a situation where to absorb all the labor you have to have an expansion of the rate of the market which is very very difficult in any modern capitalist economy and the more technical progress the more labor saving mechanism mechanization artificial intelligence robotization you have the more and more this problem must become you and this is why keynesian economics is i mean revival of how to integrate demand in the modern capitalist system is so important because unless you are able to do that you will always get answers which does not tally at all with the real world you introduce artificial intelligence people will be much better off but then what about jobs what about employment why doesn't it why wouldn't it happen it would not happen because the market would not expand at the rate at which productivity would increase this was hadert's lesson hadert's lesson was not what solo tried to make it out what is the rate at which the two stability would be reached and the two would grow at the same rate the two would grow at the same rate in an ideal situation but this will not happen unless market is expanding fast enough and for market to expand fast enough investment has to expand fast enough and for investment to expand fast enough say if we are talking in the context of europe the technical progress the artificial intelligence and all these things to introduce that the kind of investment which you required would be so much that it will lead to a market expansion which can absorb all the additional labor force that is when natural rate of 
natural rate and warranted rate would be the same, not otherwise. And that is why you have such a deep problem of how to maintain employment. Harrod's original equation is, of course, a bit of a caricature and overstatement. We all know that. that life. But the lesson which it gives is, I think, which is much deeper and which, which is the relevance today, that a higher natural rate of growth, that is a higher natural rate of technical progress, a higher natural rate, is not a guarantee at all of better living conditions for the majority of the people. Unless you have some other mechanism by which you can maintain effective demand, you can distribute income, blah, blah. That is why there is so much talk of suddenly there is people have suddenly rediscovered the importance of inequality and so on. But this is the first thing which you have to take away from the, uh, from the uh, sort of Keynesian discussion or Herodian discussion of long-term growth. The the second element which I wanted to tell you is its impact on environment, but not in the usual sense of you know global warming, two percent. You know, you know the Nordhaus. He provided on his numbers. He provided a carbon pricing and the data which says that, you know, something like 2% uh, global warming would be the threshold level which would be acceptable. This, this week or last week's London Economist, which is a fairly conservative paper, published a, some numbers and some discussion which said 1.5%. I mean, if you, if you have 2%, it will be just too high in terms of what is sustainable. If you go to talk to people in Norway and so on, they will say, you know, even 1% would be unsustainable and so on. But you see, one of the things about technical progress, a point which was made much earlier uh, in connection with, you know, second law of thermodynamics and so on and so forth, by, mostly by uh, some physicists, but also by some economists much earlier, which actually says that, you know, until you can find a source by which productivity can increase, and I leave it at that general level, by which productivity can increase without more energy input, you know, you will not manage to at all solve the problem. You'll just shift the problem from one area to another area, from one sector to another city, and no way you'd solve the problem. Let me just give you one example to explain this. This is you see, suppose you, I mean, this is actually, this is an example which comes from, what is his name? Martinez, Alia, you know, the uh, Spanish uh, economist who worked for a long time on environment and so on. One of the, one of his interesting data on very simple agriculture is when you go into more sophisticated agriculture, meaning with more cap capital for chemical fertilizers and, you know, more controlled water through energy and so on. You know what you end up with if you do the energy, if you do the first the profit balance and you see that the, whatever, given the prices of energy and given the price of water and so on and so forth, it is profitable to produce modern technology. You do the energy balance because the energy balance is really the second law. That is, you know, you, you have to conserve, it is a conservation of energy. You look at the energy balance and what you see is that almost every modern farming, I'm not even going into industry, every modern ways of doing farming, raising, for example, grains, olives, all these very simple stuff, if you try to do it, you will see that the energy input is higher than the output. And at the margin, it keeps on increasing. The more modern techniques you go, the energy intake is higher. This, I think, is the essential story behind why technical progress has such a strong negative effect on environment. And it is likely to increase 
you know it is likely to increase if you really accelerate the thing so one simple way to look at it is when people talk about you know this technology would be much better this robotization would be much better and so on to ask what would be the energy input and to calculate the energy input there are now not now there has been fairly good ways you can use the leon tf inverse input output table just like you people calculate the labor theory of value rightly or wrongly how much is the direct and indirect labor requirement or you know in round and round calculation you can do an energy calculation and it has been done by using the i minus a inverse and you can see that in most cases an expansion of industry with the modern industry at the margin increases the energy input is actually higher than the energy output now this being the case i think when you talk of growth theory and sustainable development one way of doing this would be to restate the argument of efficiency in same in the same term and i sum up by not by telling you about growth models but by what you actually get out of it all the first thing you get is if you have relatively limited demand not not full employment you are not always on the production possibility frontier not always on the production function but somewhere inside and you are somewhere inside because your demand is your demand constraint if your effective demand is a size of the market is a problem then the first thing which you get is if you have technical progress which i was trying to say if you have technical progress it means as productivity increases unless you are able to absorb that product entire amount of labor force you would have output growth with unemployment growth obviously i know mean, suppose your output grows at you know six times which is not a you know when at least in agriculture and so on when you bring people out in modern industry also when you you know close down the textile factory and set up something which is much more modern in i'll just give you one example china which has been a great success as an exporter they increased this is a world bank data i confirmed it this is also the chinese official statistics more or less the same you know china increased its very traditional increase its textile but textile standardized and so on which it can sell in the western market its textile production i think six six times this yes. textiles production four times or six times i have forgot now between four and six times it increased in output of textile because it wanted to have standardized production in the modern market which it could sell in europe and america because of its export led growth under its labor force was reduced to by 60% it became 40% of the labor force mechanization labor productivity was much higher efficiency was much higher but they could only absorb that amount of laborers who could who would sell to the market the either the western market mostly to the western market or to the chinese market now they are trying to change it a little bit so this is a very classic example of i could give you examples of steel everything else where output increases enormously but market does not increase so much so that you have output growth to the extent the market expands but you have a lot of joblessness this is jobless growth jobless growth in output so you have output expansion demand contraction i mean output expansion employment contraction you take energy and growth look at the same thing you have profit expansion because it's more profitable to produce in the modern way but you have energy contraction that is you you are deficit on energy just like you are deficit on employment you see you get a similar story from growth in terms of energy in terms of employment and this would be i think the modern way to look at how to think of sustainable growth in terms of employment and energy i think i'll stop here